Good news, folks. You're getting a break from the Apocrypha. Hey, poor! Hey, poor! Hey, poor! You don't have to be poor anymore! Jesus is here! The loudspeaker spoke up and said... Greetings, fellow worker slaves, podcasting at 128 kilobits from the Fortress of Squalitude, not far from the Redneck Mecca. This is the Atheist in the Trailer Park podcast. I'm your host, Tucker. Professor Fuzznuts is curled up to sleep on the couch, and Buttons is once again curled up to sleep on top of the record player. Leela is outside. Yes, it's a podcast hosted by a guy and his cats. Get over it. And the reason you're getting a break from the Apocrypha is because I have an interview with an atheist activist who goes by the Twitter handle, Scholar Atheist. I'm not sure how long I've been following her on Twitter, but a couple of months ago, her tweet switched from being related to atheism to pleas for help because of her daughter's medical condition. Now, in a perfect world, or hell, the world I grew up in, Scholar Atheist wouldn't need any support during this time. One person's income was enough to comfortably support a family, even a large one, and with her husband being active duty military and she being a school teacher, they'd have no financial worries. But because we've got a this social safety net in this country, as well as the fact that incomes haven't kept pace with inflation, she finds herself in dire straits. So, in addition to supporting her GoFundMe, I thought I'd have her on the show to discuss what it's like dealing with these problems. And I want to point out that her situation isn't at all uncommon in America. Most people don't have the resources in the U.S. to handle a major medical emergency. Even worse, as you'll hear Scholar Atheist describe, if you have insurance and are in a life and death situation, a hospital won't necessarily treat you unless you can pony up some cash during the admissions process. That's right. You could be there seconds away from death, and they're going, all right, we need $5,000 or $10,000 or $100 or whatever amount before we'll even start any procedures. I had planned on talking with Scholar Atheist for only about half an hour or so, but the conversation stretched on for almost an hour because this issue was so complicated. Also, Ariana, her daughter with the heart condition, had to make an appearance. Those of you who've been listening to the show for a while might remember the episode I did shortly after Trump won the election. In that episode, I said that until we can kick the Republicans out of power and get some sensible politicians installed, we're going to have to support and take care of one another. I have been very lucky, not only because so many of you out there have helped me, out when I've needed it, but now I have a job which pays me much more than I had been making. I am trying to repay your generosity as well as share my good fortune by helping others who haven't been as lucky as I have. I know lots of us are excited now that it seems like Mueller's investigation is going to topple Trump, but getting rid of him won't solve the fundamental problems we're having as a nation, even if it will remove the most direct threat to our national survival. We still have a ways to go, probably 2021 at the very earliest, before we can really breathe a sigh of relief and know that things are going to be okay. Until then, each of us needs to do whatever we can, no matter how small it might be, to help one another out. One final note, I want to give an update on Beth from the Beyond the Trailer Park podcast situation. She's not reached her fundraising goal yet either, but she's raised enough to cover her rent for the week. Yes, she has to pay her rent weekly because she can't afford to pay it all at once. That's poverty in America for you. Okay, now let's get to my interview with Scholar Atheist. And I want to make a quick note, there's some weird audio issues um, involved with this. I've done what I can to correct it, but I can't get rid of all of it. I am going to have to tear the system apart and do some rebuilding because that's the only way I'm going to fix those issues. All right, now on to the interview. 
My guest for this part of the show is, goes by the name of Scholar Atheist on Twitter. She is a teacher in Louisiana, right? Yes, sir. And um, she is currently dealing with an issue that millions of Americans have to deal with, and she is trying to take care of her daughter with very little support whatsoever. So, um, let's talk, what's your daughter's medical condition? Um, she has a, a congenital heart defect called coarctation of the aorta, which is when um, the aorta basically, not to get into like the scientific explanation, but um, the aorta basically closes in on itself. And um, typically it's found when a child is born and they're able, they go in, they do open heart surgery and they remove the little piece that is closing and it's, it's kind of, that's when it's usually taken care of. Well, for, with Ariana, for some reason, we, we don't know why, but um, they didn't catch it when she was born and they didn't catch it until she was five. And by that point, her aorta was so closed off that her blood pressure, for example, a child at that age, blood pressure should be about um, in the 90s over, I forget the bottom number, but like in the 90s. And hers was one like 150 or higher. And so she had severe hypertension, but then she only had a blood pressure in the 70s in her legs. So she wasn't getting blood flow to her legs and... Um, so her aorta was almost completely shut. The pictures are horrifying um, of her aorta. And then she had some uh, kind of permanent damage, like a thickened valve. And um, her other parts of her heart, kind of, the muscles had built up to get really a lot thicker than they should have been. Because they had been pushing, uh, trying to push through this closure for so many years. And no one knew. And, you know, it's just one of those conditions where they either usually catch it when they're babies or they find it, you know, I hate to say, but in an autopsy. And so we were told that she was basically could have had, um, uh, it's a little hard, but she basically could have had um, a stroke or heart failure any day. And um, so it was a lot to take in because we found out about it. And then within two weeks, and there was only a couple of, there was a couple of reasons why we had to put it off for two weeks. No, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that thing. Ariana. Sorry, she's talking to me. Um, <laughs> but um, they had to go in and kind of have an emergency surgery and they put in a stint, you know, to open it up. Well, you know, the idea behind a heart stint is that, you know, a bench, they can always go in with a balloon through the leg, you know, artery and expand it whenever they need to. So the plan was always that whenever Ariana gets a little bit bigger, we'll go in, we'll expand the stent and it'll be no big deal in and out of the hospital. No problem. Well, two years ago they went in and they were going to go in and expand her stent because she was having her blood pressure was, had gotten a lot worse. She had gotten too big for her stent and they went in and came back out and said, if we try to expand her stent, her AR is going to rupture and she's going to die on the table. We can't do it. Um, they said that, and this was a different state where the stent was put in. So it was a different surgical team and everything. They said um, that basically uh, where they put the stent was not in the right spot. And so, the stent didn't cover the entire diseased portion of her aorta. So the aortic, aortic arch had continued to shrink. And um, so if they went and tried to expand the stent, the aortic arch would not expand and it would bust. And so they put her on stronger meds. She's been on high blood pressure meds since she was five years old. They put her on higher, stronger meds and then just said, okay, we're going to put it off as far as we can because nothing that we can possibly do is, is safe. We're going to put it off until she's a little bit bigger and maybe and reassess it then. Um, and so uh, they went ahead and they put it off as far as they could. We, they went back and looked at it 
a year and a half later, which would have been in June that just passed and, um, reassessed it and they came out and I knew it, I knew it, it was my worst nightmare because they had already, they had already explained to me, um, that if they had to do open heart surgery, nobody knew what to do. They didn't know how to fix it because it wasn't a situation that <laughs> normally happens. It's not just the birth defect, but it's the way the birth defect was handled. And so over two years, they had been, um, talking with cardiatric, you know, cardiologists and surgeons across the world as to how to fix this. And everybody from what I've told would just say, why the hell they put that stent there? And, you know, they had never really come up with a safe plan. And, um, last I had spoke to her cardiologist, you know, um, before June, he said, you know, if they have to do open heart surgery, there's about a half a percent, half 50% chance that she'll be paralyzed. And, um, it's just that dangerous. We don't want to do that, you know? And so June came around, they, they looked again. And, you know, when the, when the cath surgeon came out after just maybe an hour, um, I knew I, I could see on his face that they couldn't fix it. And we were going under the knife. And, um, it was a horrible, you know, situation. And, you know, we, we found out in June and, um, met with her surgeon shortly thereafter. And thankfully for us, our local hospital here in New Orleans had just kind of expanded their cardiac, um, their pediatric cardiology team. And they had broke out the big checkbook, so to speak, to get one of the best cardiac surgeons in the country. And they had bought his whole team of 50. Uh, his name's Dr. Benjamin Peeler. And he's only one of about, they said about four surgeons in the country that could even do what they needed to do to her. If he wasn't here, we would have had to go, they said, to Boston. And um, so we met with him and he told us, he, you know, he walked in the room and he said, I've got three options of what um, I think that I can do for her. But he kept telling us, you know, but it's not safe. It's not going to be safe. This is very not safe. There's no guarantees. And I just, I just had my head down, you know, in my hands because I was horrified and she was in the room. Unfortunately, she refused to leave. Um, and he said, I think we're going to do part. We're going to do the, the first, the first option, but let me go over them with you. And he went over all of them with us and each one sounded worse than the next. And, um, and then after he finished explaining all of them, he changed his mind and decided to go with a different one, which didn't make us feel better. It's like, you're the expert, but you just changed your mind after a 30 minute talk with us. And, um, you know, but she got to make a wish trip. We went in August and that really did kind of set things to where we knew there, you know, when you're having breakfast with all the sick kids at the sick kid resort thinking, I may lose my child. I, she may not be, this may be my last trip with her. And, um, you know, she had surgery in August and, um, what they had to do was they had to, um, go in and, um, they put a bypass to just enhance her chances, a temporary one. They had to vertically cut open her aorta they had to, um, obviously cut the blood flow off in it and sh the blood, you know, like they had that machine that it puts, um, transfused blood into her, like, you know, passing it through and kind of acting as her heart. They had to cut out the existing stent as much as they could. And then they graft it with, um, cow heart tissue. But the kicker was that if he didn't start the blood flow back in her aorta within 30 minutes, she'd be paralyzed for life. And he did it in 27 minutes. And, um, you know, his team's great. So they kept coming, update us and update us and update us. But she definitely was at risk for not making it. He made that very clear. She was definitely at risk for being paralyzed. And, um, you know, and she did walk out of it with a paralyzed vocal cord. And that is permanent. So she does cough and she does choke. She did not have a voice after her surgery. And I have posted some video clips of her trying to talk after her surgery and you can't hear her, but, um, they've since been able to do some surgeries to turn her vocal cord to just make it a little bit better. 
And, um, but so basically I know I made that long story as short as I could, but that's really where she's at. It's not as simple as a birth defect. It's a, a little more involved. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, I have some idea of how serious all that is. I had uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine had a similar condition. She was lucky in that they caught it when she was young. Um, yeah. But she, but she ended up with, I mean, this was, gosh, I don't know how, this must have been almost 30 years ago when she had the surgery, so she ended up with a giant zipper on her chest. Oh, gosh, that's as, terrible. As it's called, you know, as they call it, the, the, the big surgery scar. And, right, right, yeah. And I know even after she, because she had the surgery, I think when she was like four, and even after she had the surgery, she still, and I knew her when she was in her 20s, they, she would still have to periodically go for a chest x-ray just to check everything to make sure it was still all right. Yeah, Ariana's surgery, they went in through her back. Um, and there are pictures that, you know, that, you know, you, I, that I've put up that you can see, um, which they said was more painful because it cuts through so much muscle. And here we are like seven months later and she complains about back pain all the time. Um, but that's just where the aorta is. And so they had to go in through that way. So she doesn't have the chest scar. She has one on her back. But, um, you know, even that, you know, when you're a parent and your kids going through something like that, even, you know, I would cry about that. I've got a beautiful child and, and all, you know, and yeah, she's still going to be beautiful, but she's going to be a teenager with this huge scar, you know, like, how's that going to feel? You know, it's, there's not one thing that you worry about or that you are depressed about or, or you know, there's lots of things. You know, um, there's just no way to make it, um, you know, people always try to make it better. Like, well, even my husband, he'll say, well, at least she's still here. It could have turned out so much worse. I'm aware of that, but it still sucks, you know. And, um, you know, Ariana, you know, we've had so much trouble um, with this situation because, you know, she was in the ICU for a week and she had ICU psychosis really, really bad. Um, and so it basically is when you're not even, you're not even in like the right reality. We didn't know what it was until it happened to her, um, where she was in ICU in her hospital bed, not able to obviously get up and walk around. And she thought that she was in a restaurant and she was asking for to go boxes. She kept trying to get up and, and leave the restaurant and was like, no, we've got to leave the restaurant, mommy. We've got to go. And she's fighting to get out of the bed. They had to sedate her because we were having to hold her down and she was fighting us and it went on for days. Um, and it was really scary because she's trying to get out of the bed you know, and she can't get out of the bed. And, um, and, you know, after that was all over, you know, you know, I, you know, I had to miss a lot of work obviously at the beginning with her, but you know, she just continued to think that something was wrong with her. You know, she's got all these health problems, you know, she's got all these issues because of her condition you know, she does have hypertension. She will for the rest of her life. She's going to be on high blood pressure medicine for the rest of her life. She takes meds at night and in the morning, two different types. Um, they've already, we already know that she probably can't have kids and she's 11, you know, and these things are, you know, we, we know all these things, but you know, she would always tell me like, mommy, I think I had a heart attack. Mommy, I think I just had a stroke you know, and mommy, something's wrong. I know something's wrong. And, and, you know, and then she had two more surgeries after her open heart surgery for her vocal cord. So between the coughing and the choking and the pain and just the worry that she used to cry right after her surgery, why does this keep happening to me? Cause here she is having surgery again. And, um, you know, and, and it got to the point where even though she did go back to school after her surgery, she went back to school after about two and a half, two months or so, two and a half months, she was calling me pretty much every day from school. 
mommy, you know, I'm feeling this mommy, I'm feeling that mommy, I need some medicine, mommy, I'm having pain. And I kept having to leave work and like, I'd have to get someone to watch my class. And here I am kind of like getting into trouble, but I've got to go. No, but I don't have family here, you know? And then right around, right within two weeks after her second vocal cord surgery, which was only three months after her heart surgery, she went into full blown PTSD and she just started like, it, I mean, most people kind of have an idea of the symptoms of PTSD, but that's where she was. Like she would cry hysterically. She would have panic attacks at least every couple of hours. They would go on all day. She's hyperventilating like, <gasps> you know, like she can't breathe. She's telling me she's never going to be able to be happy again. And this is an 11 year old child who's always been such a Ariana is just such a fun kid. She's she doesn't like to watch TV until now, you know, because she's ill. Um, she likes to play and she's always happy. And all of a sudden she's telling me she can never be happy. She's hiding, hiding in closets. You know, she'll go from one extreme to the next. She was incredibly manic and um it got to the point where her school said she can't, she can't come to school. You know, she just can't, she can't come to school. And obviously I felt the same way, but I didn't know what to do, you know, because it's like my work is giving me so much trouble. Like when are you coming back to work? Why aren't you at work? It, they weren't real, they weren't real empathetic through this whole thing. And, um, so I really didn't know what to do. And, um, you know, it got to the point where, I had to leave with her and I had, you know, I was out for, you know, five months, um, of the year that I've, the school year that I've missed, you know, and it's only a nine month school year, <laughs> you know, I'm a teacher and, um, you know, but she just, I couldn't leave her at school. And that's when we finally said, okay, something's wrong mentally and got her a referral to a psychiatrist, a psychologist. And that was back at the very beginning of December. And she originally, they thought she'd be out of school for maybe a couple of months, maybe a month, maybe a couple of weeks. We really didn't know. There's no, there's no instruction manual, you know, on how to, how this is going to work. And, um, you know, so I was forced to go back home with her and, and take leave and I'm getting docked this whole time. And, um, you know, and so they wrote a note, okay, she's going to be out until, you know, January 4th, you know, and then she's going to be out until March and then the end of March. And then they told me about three weeks ago that they're keeping her out the whole school year. So, you know, it's just, uh, we really don't know. She's on meds for obviously for her PTSD, but like, like I had posted on Twitter recently, um, she had, she always has slept in her bed her whole life and, and, she had all of a sudden just started to say that she was feeling paranoid. She's scared. She kept waking me up. So now she's back. She's sleeping on, on, uh, on some blankets on my floor, like a thick stack of blankets and in my room. And, um, so I don't know if her meds are not working as well anymore or what's, I don't really know what's going on. Um, so I'm going to have to get with her psychiatrist about that and try to figure out, where do we go from here? You know, cause I want her to be able to go to school next year, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's, I mean, talk about the financial side of things, uh, a little bit. Cause, you know, I, I don't know what, you know, it's like being a school teacher in Louisiana, but normally, at least most places I've lived, if you've got a job that's connected to the state, like being a teacher, you're supposed to have really good health insurance and other benefits and from you know the way you've talked it sounds like that's not quite the case there well you know a lot of people even though it doesn't say it on my gofundme a lot of people get um for some reason think that our go my gofundme is for medical coverage it's actually not my husband's military so we her medical care is paid oh, that's cool. um yeah my my gofundme is because i've been getting docs pay for five months and, um, with that being said, you know, I've been getting docked half my pay and that's a lot. We do depend on both our salaries to pay our mortgage and, you know, and, and our cars. And obviously this is never something that we planned. 
Now, when she was in the hospital, um, our being at the hospital was not covered. It was not free. So when she was in the hospital, I had a, a separate GoFundMe back then. And then I opened this one once I, I realized I was going to be out with her for not two months, but in cr- a lot longer. Um, and um, when I, we were in the hospital, we had to get, you know, a room so we could maybe get a little shut eye when she had another visitor and stuff like that. So at the hospital, they have a room just like at like the Ronald McDonald house. They have you know, like a hotel there for the parents who, you know, have to stay there because her hospital's not in our town. It's, it's a, it's, it's nearby, but it's still about an hour away. And we had to pay a hundred dollars a night <laughs> to stay there. We had to buy all of our food. Um, I was not leaving the hospital. Sometimes I would eat a back, uh, like a box of saltine crackers out the vending machine, um, because it was really expensive, but the majority of the GoFundMe, that is because I'm getting docked between twelve and sixteen hundred dollars a month every month that I've been out. And um starting on the ninth of April, I ran out of extended sick leaves. So then my doc pay for any days that I miss until the end of the school year is docked at a hundred percent. And the way that they, the way that it works as a school teacher is although you get paid for 12 months, when they dock your pay, they dock your pay based on how many days that you work, that you're physically there. So they dock your pay based on the nine months that you're there. So I know it sounds crazy, like, wow, you know, she's getting docked up to $1,600 a month. Well, there's no way that she makes, you know, um, double that. You're right. My take home pay is not that much, but based on the nine months that we do work, that's how they base it. So if I miss one day of work this week, for example, it, they dock me over $300 for a day, for one day. Ouch. Yeah. So basically for each full week that I would miss, I would have negative paychecks that would just get caught up in the summer. Hey, Ariana. Why am I so loud? <laughs> Do you want to say hello? No. No. I don't no. to be a part of your podcast commentary. Okay, well, I'm just talking. You're a commentary, and I don't want to be a part of our audio commentaries on Psych. I like it. She said she wants to have some audio commentaries on Psych. Especially the yang yang ones, those are good commentaries. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Well, that's Ariana. Half the time I watch the audio, com- audio commentaries, this is what I'm <laughs> But she loves the show psych, but, um, I'm sorry. But anyway, and so over the summer, then it would, I guess it would catch up. I don't know. I've never missed so much work. So, um, you know, um, so that's really how it works and it's, it sucks because I always end up getting docked every year because I do miss a lot of work with her because she has a lot of uh, doctor's appointments every year. We only get 10 days. Yes, at- Skype. Yes, I'm on Skype. Erin, mom has been asked a question. I'm just trying to answer it, okay? Um, so we get like 10 days of leave for the school year. But that includes health appointments. That includes everything. And I always end up getting docked several days every year because I have to miss a lot of work with her as it is. But this time, it I had to go and ha- take extended sick leave, which doesn't dock you 100%. It docks you 40 but I ran out of that because you only get so much extended sick leave every five years. So I basically used my five years of extended sick leave this one school year. So for the next four years, I have no extended sick leave. Really, it really sucks. It's definitely put us in a, a position, you know. Yeah. yeah. But what you going to do? I mean, it was it's my kid or and it's going to be Ariana. You know, it's going to be her. I'm going to prioritize her. Uh, somebody's got to be there. I know. I, I completely understand. I don't have kids, but uh, I, I, you know, from the, the, you know the financial aspect of, of having to make the sacrifices. I know what that's like, and I have you know roughly a third of the listeners to my podcast are overseas in places like Europe, where they have. You know, a social safety net that helps take care of people in situations like this. Right, exactly. And you know, there's a, there's so many people in America that don't have 
the health care coverage that obviously we we do have because my husband's military. You know, so we've got, you know, something that a lot of people don't. And that's really unfortunate because, you know, I couldn't imagine going through something like this. I mean, yeah, I'm getting docked pay and that sucks. And there have been times that, you know, I've definitely had to run up credit cards over this period in time. A lot of money on my credit cards, you know, that I've had to pay back. But obviously my, you know, my Twitter friends and, and stuff have really helped a lot in, in trying to ease that burden. But there are so many people that do have to give up their house, you know, and, and stuff like that in order to, it's either that or let your kid die of cancer. You know, when Ariana had her first surgery, I was a teacher, but I was not yet married. Um, my husband is, is we've been together since she's one years old, but he's on her biological dad, but you'd swear he is because he's been there and takes care of her like she's his own. But um, I had school health insurance at the time and she needed this surgery. It was an emergency surgery. She had to have it or she's going to die. And the hospital would not touch her until I gave them $5,000. That's... That was my deductible. And I did not have that money. You know, I had been a single mom for a long time um, because Eric, my oldest daughter, um, she's about to graduate in two weeks. And her dad and I got divorced when she was three. And so I was a single mom for a long time. I did not have that kind of money. Thankfully, that that particular school year, I agree, like I signed on and agreed for them to take so much out of my paycheck every month that goes into some kind of a like um, medical savings plan. Mm -hmm. So they, they give you like a credit card and you can use that for doctors and whatever. And it just so happened to equal almost five thousand dollars. So in January, when she had her surgery, I had exhausted that whole amount but if it wasn't for that, I don't know what <laughs> what would have happened because they uh, they wouldn't schedule her surgery until I gave them five thousand dollars. And I actually I was talking to Ariana Ariana about this recently because she's super intelligent. She's such an empathetic person, and you know she we were just kind of having a conversation about people and different you know things that go on. And I told her about that. And she said, well, what would have happened if you didn't have the money? Like, she just didn't understand. She's like, how could they, they do that? It's like, well, they, that's what they do. You know, that it's unfortunate, but that's, that's, that happens in this country. You know, my parents are very poor. I don't have any family that, um, could have paid that bill for me, you know, and, um, so I, I just, you know, that, that's really horrible. And I just, I'm, I'm very envious of people that <laughs> live in places that don't have to worry about that, you know, or that have more time that they can miss without getting, you know, docked to the kind of pay that I've been docked, you know, for being out with Ariana. Because I exhausted all of my paid leave when she was still in the hospital. So by the time she was home from the hospital and recovering, I was already starting to get docked pay. Um you know, and uh, I'm one of the lucky ones to even have that option, you know, to even have insurance, you know, or have paid leave because a lot of people in America don't. Yeah, that's uh, uh, it, shocking. I mean, because, you know, it's we, sh we should be a compassionate society, but clearly we're not. We clearly seem to care more about money than we do people. At least the people that that are in control are that are in charge, you know, and and that's really unfortunate, you know, and like another example, when Ariana was little before I got married and got uh, military health insurance, her blood pressure medication was something like one hundred eighty dollars a month. And, and it was compounded. They had to make it because most five-year-olds are not on high blood pressure meds. So they had to make it and insurance didn't pay for it. So, I mean, it was, <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> I did get married. And, you know, my husband, his insurance, you know, does cover her because, um, I, like, I know what it's like to be on the other side. You know, I've, 
I filed bankruptcy when I was in my twenties because of medical bills, because I have a health condition that I've had many, many surgeries for. So, you know, I have been on that other side and so I get it, you know, and, um, it's really sad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is. And, um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the struggles that you're going through, uh, and, you know, from the way you talk, it doesn't sound like you're going to be out of the woods anytime soon, if ever. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, you know, school lets out May 24th. So I'm off the summer and I'm hoping that we can work with Ariana's doctors to try to wean her off the psychiatric meds that she's on because she is on meds for, you know, for her PTSD. And I just really want to do whatever we have to do to make sure that come August, she can go back to school and start a new school year and psychologically be better because physically her cardiologists have checked her over and over and over because she keeps complaining of chest pains. She, you know, continues to think that something's wrong with her and she, cause she's worried, you know, and so they say that her heart's great and, you know, they know that they'll have to go in and put a stint in her when she's about 20 years old, but hopefully she has, doesn't have to face any more surgeries like that. You know, it's just to get her psychologically back to where, she can go to school because right now she doesn't even want to leave the house. She won't leave to go grocery shopping. She won't leave to go see any of her friends. She, she just wants to stay home. She doesn't want to go anywhere. And, um, that's not going to work when she needs to go back to school. So that's really, cause if she can't go back to school, if she won't go back to school, the next year is going to look a whole lot like this year. And I don't want that to happen. I mean, I, I don't, I just can't, I can't imagine. I'm hoping that that's not going to be what it's going to be because I won't have that extended sick leave to fall back on because it's all used up, you know? So, um, I really don't know what to do, you know? And my husband took two weeks off with her as well. So that way I could go back to work a couple of times, um, for the week. So it's just, I don't know. <laughs> every, every day we just kind of keep, hoping that she'll turn a corner, you know? Yeah. Um, if, you, if you don't mind my asking, what's your husband's position in the military? Um, he's he's in the Coast Guard, and um, he's a pilot, but he's not flying right now. He's not, he's not going to fly for the military anymore. His last, he's on his last um, station, and he's flying a desk, so he calls it. Okay, so... He's he's at a very low risk of, of getting deployed anywhere. Correct. Um, he every year he'll leave for a couple of weeks here or there. There a couple years ago, I think it was like a year and a half to two years ago, he left for six weeks. But um, no, thankfully not. I mean, he used to be in the Navy, but ever since he's in the Coast Guard now, he doesn't leave. But for a couple weeks to maybe two months, depending on what's going on and where, where they need him to go. Usually it's for some kind of a training where he'll have to go for, for a little bit longer, but definitely not a, de like a full fledged deployment. Right. Right. And even though the Coast Guard, most people don't know this, but the Coast Guard does get deployed overseas. He's, yeah. He's unlikely for that to happen. Being in. N yeah. Not being in the position he's in now, you know, when he was flying, um, he had to, you know, and go to, he did have to go into overseas and they went to a couple different places, um, like Cuba and Puerto Rico and different places like that. But he doesn't have to do that stuff anymore. But I definitely don't know what I would do without him for sure. He definitely is there to help at least, you know, cause sometimes by, by the evening, I've had it up to my eyeballs, you know, I've been Ariana all day, you know, with her all day. And, um, I love her very much. And, you know, but all she wants to do nowadays is watch psych and it's my favorite show. And now I don't want to watch it again for a long time. Cause, 
because the we've it's got seven seasons and we've already watched it twice. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, okay, uh, I'm gonna go over there and uh, hang out with Ariana, <laughs> you know. And he loves to do it, so it's okay. And I try to find time where I can spend some time with my oldest daughter too, because she does get quite jealous that Ariana gets all of the attention. Uh, Ariana just walked in and said, no, she gets all the attention. They just, they go back and forth. Yeah, and, and caring full time for someone who's, who's seriously ill, even if they're a good patient, is, is difficult to do, I know from personal experience. Yeah, definitely. You know, and then I had surgery in November. So I was sick, and I actually had surgery in June as well. So my husband says he, this family can't take any more surgeries. We, <laughs> it needs to stop. Um, he's the only one that doesn't ever have surgeries. Yes. Ariana says we. <laughs> she doesn't want people to think we're a family in bad health. <laughs> And no, Ariana, go shower. She's going shower, but she keeps poking her head out the door. Ariana. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, <laughs> I'm sorry. She keeps talking to me. I'm laughing at her, and she keeps telling me, I'm not funny. Stop laughing. Um, this, this child's a trip. I'm, I apologize. You know, you can't. I... I definitely can't uh, focus on one thing right now, for sure. Do you hear her? Do you actually hear her talking? Uh, I can't make out what she's saying, but I can hear her. It's something ridiculous, trust me. Okay, I'm going to go in the other room now. No, wait, I didn't finish yet. If you're on a vacation trip, then I am really wonderful. (laughs) Okay, Ariana. All right, ow! All right, I, she she just pushed me out of the room because oh, she was going on about some random nonsense. Uh, I'm sorry, you were you were about to ask me something? Yeah, I, I just something that popped into my head um, that you might be able to try. Wouldn't be terribly expensive, um, but it might help her. Have you heard? Do you know what Google Cardboard is? No. Okay, it's um, it, it's basically it's. A cardboard box that you can fold up and put around your your smartphone so it turns it into a VR headset. And you could try that with some, like, outdoor scenes and see how she reacts to that. Maybe. Oh, uh, you mean, like, just for, like, something that's pretty calming? Well, that, and I was thinking it, it may help her, you know, get used to the idea of being outside the house again. Because she would you know, it look like she's out, you know, to, it would have some of the sensations of being outside, but it would still, you know, she'd still have, know that she was inside the house. Yeah. And I mean, we've got, we've got big windows, you know, and we live, um, we actually, our house backs up to kind of like, um, it's a waterway back there. So she can see out. She just doesn't like to go places, you know, and, um, it's weird because, for for a couple of maybe two months, she would go every day and walk her cat. As crazy as it sounds, her cat loves to walk. And I've put videos on Twitter of her walking her cat. She'd go walk her cat up and down the street, and she'd go ride her bike and stuff like that. But um, all of a sudden, she won't go walk her cat. I keep telling her, Ariana, go walk Simba. Simba wants to go walk. And even today, she, no, it was yesterday, because today's been raining all day. Um, yesterday, she she changed her clothes. And she said she's going to go walk Simba. And then she just, she never did. She never made her way that way. So, because I keep hoping she'll do that, you know, and then, like, get out a little bit. Because I definitely know that her not um, getting out is affecting her sleep. You know, I mean, because she's cooped up all day and I'm cooped up all day and it drives me nuts. So I'm sure it's not helping, but there's only so much you can do. You know, whenever you're depressed, a lot of people and I know, I mean, I'm depressed, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with, you know, psychological 
um, you know, issues because of what, you know, we've gone through. And sometimes you don't want to get out of bed or whatever the case may be. And, you know, I think that's what she's experiencing right now. And (laughs) I try to encourage it. I try to kind of push her on her way, but, um, she's just, she's just not there, you know, now she was supposed to go spend the night tonight with her best friend. Who's it's her cousin. And, um, she's not gone in months. And the last time she went, she was texting me at midnight, which is something she'll do if she's not in the room with me. And so she was an hour away and that was a problem. I couldn't go get her, you know, I mean, I've done it. I've gone get her from over there twice in the middle of the night within the last year and a half or so. And, um, you know, so we talked about it. She didn't, she didn't want to go. And we talked about it and just decided she's going to go for the day tomorrow. So like it or not, she's going to go for the day. And I asked her, are you excited? Well, you're making me go, you know, but I was, we're, she's going to need to go, you know, like we kind of need to nudge her to go and hang out with people that she loves and get out of this house because it's, it's not benefiting her to not want to leave the house. I mean, something that she loves to do, like go eat out or go eat Thai food or something. I can't even get her to go do that. She'll just tell me to bring her something home. And that's definitely not her. And that's why I'm concerned that her medication may not be working as, as, as effectively as it was. Okay. Um, and one final question, then I'll let you go here because kept you on for about an hour now. Um, <laughs> how, how much trouble was it for you to get her seen by a psychiatrist? Um, it was not, it wasn't any trouble because everybody knew that that's what she needed. Like I went to her, um, I went to her cardiologist who was amazing. We love her, her new cardiologist. Well, we've been seeing him about three years since we moved here. And I went to him and told him some of the things that she was starting to do. And, um, like some of the things she was starting to say and, you know, um, always saying that she's like feeling this or hearing that or see, you know, and she wasn't full fledged PTSD yet, but something wasn't right. And he told me, and I, I'm not, I don't want to pull up the message to read it right now. Cause it might take a minute, but he basically said that this sounds like something very common that kids in her shoes experience, you know, and I had had researched about this and actually found out that there are studies that heart heart kids like her that have had open heart surgery and spent time in ICU. There are many of them that end up with PTSD, not the little young kids because they don't tend to know where they are, but kids her age. And so her cardiologist was actually the one that suggested it. He said um, in the message, he said, take her to the pediatrician and get her a referral to go see a psychologist. And so we did that. But within the next couple weeks, because this was all during the holidays, within the next couple weeks, things had gone from bad to worse. And she started to have like full fledged panic attacks. And that's when I talked to her site. I went back to her. Um, pediatrician and I begged her I was like please like can you please give her medication she's having panic attacks she's not sleeping because she would go all night like whole whole nights without sleeping and you know her pediatrician said you know I can't give her anything but she definitely needs it and and her principal as well had had also recommended she see one so everybody is pushing us in that direction. And so we were had no problem. We just had to wait a couple of weeks to get the referral from the insurance. But um, actually, it was it was really easy. I would think, <clears throat> obviously, some insurances might be different. Um, but it was that the thing that took the longest was waiting for the the appointment with the psychiatrist to get her a medication, which was a, a mad, I was really scared because Ariana, 11 years old, was talking to me like I thought she was going to commit suicide. And um, that was 
some really scary couple of weeks. And my husband and I both debated we would actually talk about whether or not we were going to admit her in the psychiatric institution because we didn't know how to protect her because she kept saying, I can never be happy again and, and things like that. And I was so scared. I didn't, you know, I mean, Ariana went from this one of like happy, happy, happy child to like, she just, life is too much for her, you know? And, um, that was the worst part is waiting for that, you know, cause it's, it took a while to get in with the psychiatrist. They tend to be a bit busier, but those are the ones that write those prescriptions, you know, and, and so we had to wait for that. And then they had to, they had to increase her prescription because it wasn't quite doing enough. But, um, yeah, I mean, we were able to do that fairly easily. I mean, I'm sure other people have not been able to, but thankfully we were, we didn't have much of a problem. That's good. Okay. Um, well, I, I will let you go. I will put a link to your GoFundMe in the show notes for this episode. Um, and, okay, I appreciate that. No, no problem. And hopefully, uh, things will work We didn't out. even get to talk about atheism, did we? <laughs> no, no. Oh, that's a whole nother hour talk, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, I live in Tennessee, so I have some idea of what it's like to be an atheist in the South. But uh, Especially a teacher is much... Usually my um, Twitter is anonymous. Uh, I don't have my picture on it or anything like that. And... I had to kind of come out of the shadows because my, our family was not really helping us and we needed help. You know, I really needed help. So I ended up putting my GoFundMe on Twitter and just kind of took that risk. But as soon as I'm, you know, back getting regular paychecks, I'm going to have to start pulling pictures off again because it's definitely given me, giving me problems at work being a public school teacher and, and students find you and, they start printing out things you post and bringing it to the principal. And it's just seriously, then things, those things have happened more than once. <laughs> so, um, you know, I appreciate it, but yeah, that's definitely a, a in Tennessee, you understand for sure. Yeah. yeah. But as a teacher, it's even scarier because, you know, parents and kids, they, they have a lot of pull, you know, and they don't want no devil worshipers teaching their kids. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, and and there's uh, what, there, there was that school district in Louisiana where uh, they they were harassing the kid that was Buddhist. And yep, that was right where I used to live. I used to have to report that school to FFR. I mean, the district that I used to work at um, had uh, it was bad. Let's just put it that way. It was bad, and it was. Um, it was maybe an hour away from the district that that happened at. And um, I wasn't surprised whatsoever because I've seen worse, unfortunately, but I have. I wish we could get out of the Bible Belt. That would be great. <sighs> maybe one day. I want to move to Norway. My husband said it's too cold. <laughs> well, um, apparently... If, if you um, have certain skills, it's really easy to get into New Zealand, which has, you know, a lot of the things like socialized medicine, et cetera, et cetera, that places like Norway have, and it's not quite so cold. Hey, I'm going to I'm gonna have, to, I'm gonna have to put that one on him and see what he says. <laughs> yeah, I... Because I... I I do not want to live in the South. He likes the South for retirement because it's cheap and they don't tax military retirement. But I would like to keep my sanity and not live in the Bible Belt. It's, you know, people don't even realize how, um, how much you're discriminated against or even literally bullied here. And, you know, and you really have to be. You can't, you can't come out and, and even be an open atheist, not where I live. Yeah. Yeah. No. You I, know, I, I, believe me, I, I, <laughs> I know it well. It's, it, it's because they can't fire you for being atheist, but they can fire you for being atheist, but say it's from something else. Right. right. And they do, you know, they, they do. And so it's, 
That's why when I do take all Ariana's pictures down and my pictures down, that's why, <laughs> you know, because I'm like, okay, I got to go back undercover again because, um, I'm just, I have to protect myself and my family, you know, and we've, I've definitely seen a lot of discrimination and problems that I've had to deal with because I'm atheist. So I just, uh, try to protect myself as best as I can. Yeah. I understand. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. And uh, you have a good night. I'm going to that child's probably still talking to me. She was in the shower, but she's probably still talking. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll, I'll send you a link when I put the show out. It'll probably go out tomorrow. Um, just depends. Oh. OK. All right. Thank you so much. No problem. And All right, buddy. All right. Bye bye. Bye. That's it for this episode of the Atheist in the Trailer Park podcast. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, as well as just about anywhere else podcasts can be found. Many of the episodes are also on YouTube. Follow the show on Twitter. At Tea Park Atheist is the show's Twitter handle. It's on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash trailerparkatheist.com. If you happen to like the podcast, please rate it on iTunes. If you'd like to support the podcast, there's a donate button on the show notes page. You can support it via Patreon at patreon.com forward slash TN Tucker. Thanks for listening. Say goodnight, Fuzznuts. All I know is this violates every canon of respectable broadcasting. Damned cat. <laughs>